So this is the skin and what we're looking at up top, the uh, purple uh, layer up here, that's the epidermis, the top part of your skin that protects you from the outside world. Underneath that, all of this pink, that's the dermis and it's made mostly of collagen and its job is to support the epidermis and there are blood vessels here and other things that support and make sure that the epidermis stays happy. Let's look at the layers of the epidermis, okay? The bay is a layer of the epidermis. The cells there, they begin their life, and then they start moving up. They're pushed upwards by the production of new cells. And as they move up, they go into a new layer. This is called the spinous layer, or the stratum spinosum. And the reason it's called that is because there are actually little tiny spines, which are, which are desmosomes, in between each of the cells. You can barely see them here. We'll look at um, another uh, slide in a minute that shows them much more clearly. And um, you can see the nice round nuclei of the cell. And then as the cells get up towards the top, they begin to pick up these purple, dark purple granules in their cytoplasm. And so this is called uh, the granule layer. It makes sense, right? Because they have dark, uh, dark granules in the cytoplasm. And these are, these are keratohyalin granules. Keratohyalin granules contain a variety of different substances like loracrin and involucrin and kind of fancy things like that that dermatology residents need to know for their board exam, but probably medical students don't need to know. But the job of those granules is to kind of help the, the keratinocytes um, uh, come to the end of their life and uh, die and lose their nucleus and the skeleton, the proteins left over from inside the cells, gets transferred up here and becomes the corneal layer, the stratum corneum. And that the granular layer kind of helps um, seal these cells together, kind of cements them together like with glue. And the reason for that we do that is because you don't want, you know, water or things that are outside. This is like an extra barrier against them uh, than water or things like that getting past your epidermis. So the when you you rub your skin and those little dead cells flake away from the skin, that's what, what's flaking away there. That's the corneal layer. That layer is actually dead. It's not living any longer. And so that eventually will fall off over time. The, the time it takes for a squamous cell to get from the basal layer where it's born all the way up to the top where it kind of dies and becomes the stratum corneum is roughly 28 days depending on what source you ask. Now in some diseases, the epidermis starts growing really quickly. For example, psoriasis, it takes about seven days for a squamous cell to get from the basal layer up to the top. And then this little pink line here that you see, this is known as the stratum lucidum. And even though that, that name implies that it's clear or easy to see through, it's actually usually more pink than clear. And there's only, only two situations that you actually see a stratum lucidum in the human body. Number one is on the acral skin, the skin of the palms and soles. And number two is any skin that's been rubbed or scratched chronically begins to get a thicker granular layer and it begins to get a stratum lucidum. And eventually, if you rub and scratch the skin long enough, the whole epidermis will thicken and begin to look like the skin of the palms and soles. And that's a protective mechanism uh, to avoid uh, uh, injury of the skin. Now, a couple other things we can point out about the epidermis while we're here. Number one, there are other cells that live in the epidermis, not just keratinocytes. So these squamous cells or keratinocytes, those, those names are interchangeable, they make up the bulk of the epidermis. But we have a couple other uh, neighbors here that, that uh, play a role in the epidermis. So this one guy right here, you can see, see how he's kind of gray? It's a little hard to get him in focus, but he's a little bit gray and not quite as pink. This little gray cell has this, this vacuole around the outside, and that, that's an artifact, and the reason he has that vacuole is because it sh the cell shrinks during processing and its cytoplasm clumps up to the nucleus, and the vacuole forms around the outside because it doesn't have any desmosomes to hang on to its neighbor. So that's a melanocyte. Melanocytes are not hooked up to their neighbors. In contrast, look at these nuclei over here. These are keratinocyte nuclei, and they actually have that little halo, a little vacuole around their nucleus. Their nucleus is kind of naked, floating in the middle of that little space. That's because when they shrink up, all of their cytoplasm is hooked up to the desmosomes at the outside of the cell, and it can't go anywhere. It's, it's attached to all of the neighbors. So the poor little nucleus shrinks up and is naked and alone. So when you see vacuoles in the epidermis and you're trying to decide, is it a keratinocyte or a melanocyte, if they have the little halo right around the nucleus, it's probably a keratinocyte. If the nucleus has a little blob of spidery cytoplasm around it, like that guy, it's probably a melanocyte. So these two guys here are melanocytes. And normal melanocytes live along the basal layer. Here's another one there. You can kind of tell because you would think melanocytes, their job is what? It's to make melanin pigment that makes your skin turn colors. When you when you tan, your skin gets darker. People that are, have brown or black skin, darker skin patients, they have more 
melanin production. Not more melanocytes, but their melanocytes are just more active and make more melanin pigment. But you'd say, well, why are the melanocytes gray and not brown? That's because the melanocyte has an unusual job. It makes melanin pigment, and then instead of keeping it and hoarding it all to itself, it actually shares it with all of the, the, the uh, keratinocytes around it. So it, it has these little finger-like processes called dendrites, and it sends these little dendrites out to the keratinocytes that live directly adjacent to it. And the keratinocytes actually kind of eat the little fingers off of those little dendritic branches, and that's how they ingest um, the pigment into their cytoplasm. If you can see these cells right here, see how they have a brown pigment in the cytoplasm? That pigment is kind of over top of the nucleus. You can see it up here too. It's kind of like a little umbrella or a cap. And if you look, if you go up this way, that's where the outside world is. That's where the sun is. So the sun would come down and would normally hit these little keratinocyte nuclei. And you know, sunlight contains ultraviolet rays and ultraviolet rays damage DNA. And the DNA of cells lives inside the nucleus. And if you damage that DNA, you can get skin cancer and things like that. So the job of melanin is to kind of try to protect your skin, to absorb some of that light and protect your skin from the damaging rays of the sun. So I like to think of it as the, the melanocyte makes the pigment. See, here's another melanocyte. You know how I know? Look, it's got a vacuole on the outside and then a little blob of, of um, gray cytoplasm stuck to the nucleus, okay? So he feeds the melanin to all these keratinocytes around him. I don't know that the cells are actually all boys, but I just like to talk of them like they... Like the, like the cells are people. And if you're a pathologist too long, that's what will happen to you too. So I'm just kidding. Okay, anyway, the, the pigment up there, that little, it's like a little hat or a little umbrella, I think, to protect the nucleus of the keratinocyte from the sun. So when you see a brown pigmented cell in the epidermis, it's actually probably a keratinocyte, not a melanocyte. You would, you would think that it should be a melanocyte. So, you know, with a little practice, you can do this. That little gray guy there, that's a melanocyte. All these guys up here that are brown, those are keratinocytes. Okay, so we said there are several cells that live in the epidermis. There's another one too. Let's see if we can find one of them. Uh, we might have to hunt around a little bit. Uh, in the mid-level of the, of the epidermis near the spinous layer, we have a type of cell. That's probably one right there. It's a little hard to see them. But this little cell here that has a little bit of a kind of bean-shaped nucleus, that's called a Langerhans cell. So Langerhans cells are basically, they're kind of related to histiocytes and macrophages, and they, they live in the mid-level of the spinous layer. And the reason for that is that if the skin barrier function breaks down, antigens, things from bacteria, fungus, stuff from the outside world will come through the skin. And the Langerhans cell, their job is to kind of eat that stuff up and break down the proteins, and then they come out of the epidermis and go into the, the dermis and into lymphatic channels and go all the way back to lymph nodes and then alert the immune systems and basically say, hey, here's some stuff we found. Should, we, should the body fight against this or not? And then the immune system decides whether or not it's a bad thing or a good thing. And so that's why the Langerhans cells live in the epidermis because they're the first line of defense against an incoming uh, infection or allergen or something like that. So they, they are antigen presenting cells and they are basically related to histiocytes and they live in the mid-level of the epidermis. And they're a lot easier to see on immunostains. You can do stains for um, S100 protein or CD1A, which will highlight those Langerhans cells. And in some diseases, like some rashes, like contact dermatitis, you tend to see lots of Langerhans cells, and we'll look at that in a minute. So this is an example of acral skin, skin on the palm or sole. And you can tell that because it's got a very thick uh, corneal layer here at the top. And it's got that stratum lucidum that we talked about previously. And the reason I'm showing this, this is actually not normal skin. This is skin that's involved by contact dermatitis, like you get if you touch poison ivy. And there's uh, some extra white space up in the surface here that's making a little blister. And there's some of this stuff that's called parakeratosis. We can go closer and look. See, normally you don't have nuclei left in the corneal layer, but when skin gets irritated and starts growing quickly, the nuclei get retained. We talked a little bit about that earlier. The granular layer kind of goes away or gets diminished. And then par uh, parakeratosis, the presence of nuclei in the corneal layer, um, uh, shows up. And so that's a sign that the skin's abnormal. That's not a normal finding to have parakeratosis. It means the skin's been irritated from a dermatitis or a rash, or it's a tumor, um, a precancerous growth, something like that. So the reason I wanted to show this slide is that when you go over here, there's this space, and looking next to the space, you can see there's a lot of extra white space between each of the keratinocytes in the epidermis. 
And this is called edema, or when, it, when edema is present in the, in the epidermis, it's called spongiosis. And so spongiotic dermatitis is things like eczema or eczematous dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, contact dermatitis. There's a large number of different um, uh, rashes that give you this, uh, this finding microscopically. The reason that I'm showing you in a normal histology video is that when you look at this on higher power, what you can see, it's hard to get in focus, but between each keratinocyte, see those little lines? Those are the spines. That's why we call this the spinous layer because those spines, those are desmosomes, and you can see them much more clearly when they're stretched out by all that edema fluid in between um, each individual cell. So that, that space there is because of all the fluid that's pushing them apart, but it lets you really see how prominent those spines are. They're usually kind of difficult to see on normal skin, but here when you have spongiosis, it's a nice uh, way to showcase just how dramatic those spines are. And they're really strong because even though they're being pulled apart by all this fluid, they're holding on for dear life to their neighbor. And sometimes they, when they get pulled too hard, they lose connection. And that's when you get this little blister here. That's when, when you get these little bumps. And then those little cells inside there, these are Langerhans cells. And so we talked about Langerhans cells living in the um, mid, mid part of the epidermis. And the reason they live there is that because when you get contact with, uh, or when you touch an antigen, those cells go in and find that antigen and eat some of it and then take it back to the lymph node and uh, show it to the immune system to see if you should mount an immune response. So these little guys here, those are Langerhans cells and they're kind of collecting together and, and in contact dermatitis, you get that. Again, look at those beautiful spines there. It's really, really very nice example. And oh look, that's a mitosis too while we're, while we're here. See that? There's a little uh, mitosis that's probably an anaphase. It's on its way to becoming two new daughter cells. So the skin is revved up and, and irritated, and so it's dividing and making new cells to try to repair itself. All right, so those are the spinous, the spinous processes. Now, let's look at some more acryl skin. And this is normal acryl skin. We'll look from low power. And again, look, the really massively thickened uh, corneal layer, you can see this pale line here, that's the stratum lucidum. Again, the only place that's really present in the body normally is acryl skin on the palms and soles. And you also get it if you scratch or rub your skin. Now let's look at a couple of immunostains before we finish up. And immunostains, again, are antibodies that are targeted at certain proteins. And they are then tagged with a colored molecule. And that lets us see what, what kind of proteins we're actually uh, dealing with here. So let's start with uh, cytokeratin. So we said cytokeratin is an intermediate filament. Oops, we'll turn it around. Is an intermediate filament that um, fills up epithelial cells of all sorts. So all epithelial cells in the whole human body should have cytokeratin. They sometimes have different types of keratin, but this is a, a, uh, a, um, a marker. This one right here is a pan cytokeratin. So it stains multiple different types of keratin so that it will stain pretty much every type of keratin ideally. Um, that's out there. So if we see that positive, we know that what we're dealing with is an epithelial cell. So here, let's get it in focus. So there's the normal epidermis, and you can see the epidermis is bright, uh, this dark brown color, because it's filled with keratin filaments, whereas the dermis, which is made of collagen, is totally negative for uh, keratin. So keratin highlights the normal epidermis. And then when we look down at the structures in the epidermis, you can also see, I'm sorry, the structures down in the dermis, you can see that these things we talked about earlier, the hair follicle, also made of epithelium, so it's keratin positive. The sweat glands also made of epithelium, so they're keratin positive. So all these um, cells that are that are are brown are some sort of epithelial cell. So here we have sweat sweat glands, hair follicle, and then we already talked about that the surface in this uh, skin, the epidermal surface, is made of keratin as well. And so we can use, the reason we use these immunostains is to help us when we have tumors, if we're not sure what type of cell the tumor is coming from, we can use immunostains to help us determine if the cell is epithelial or if it's muscle or nerve or melanocyte origin. And that makes a big difference because those tumors all um, have different properties that we uh, pay attention to. So the next thing we're gonna look at is uh, S100 protein. And the reason I'm showing you S100 protein is that it does, it stains nerve and some other things, and it stains melanocytes in the epidermis. So it will stain melanocytes along the basal layer. So these little guys down at the bottom here. Let's find them. These little cells sitting on the bottom basal layer that are uh, dark brown, those are melanocytes. And you can see they have these little branches, those are, we call them dendrites, those are the branches that feed melanin to the neighboring keratinocytes. So melanocytes are S100 positive, all right?
but they're not the only cell in the epidermis that's S100 positive. You can see another branching little cell up here in the mid layer of the epidermis. Those are Langerhans cells. The only reason I can tell them apart is because of where they're located in this uh, skin, which is actually a piece of normal epidermis. So you have, uh, you have S100 positive melanocytes down at the basal layer, and then also Langerhans cells, which again are antigen processing cells up there in the uh, mid portion of the epidermis. All right, and uh, one other immunostain to show is um, a stain called SOX10, and it's a, a nuclear marker. It's a protein that's in the nucleus of melanocytes. And um, you can see this is, I'm just showing this to highlight um, that the melanocytes normally are present on the basal layer of the, the epidermis, and they're kind of spaced out. Now this is a patient with a lot of sun damage, and so the, the number of melanocytes kind of increases a little bit in sun damaged skin but they, they're down there on the basal layer for the most part. They're spread out with um, kind of one melanocyte for every seven to 10 keratinocytes, uh, depending on who you ask and where exactly you are on the body. And um, we'll look a little closer. And you can see this is highlighting the nucleus of the cell. So we showed the S100 earlier that showed both the, the cytoplasm and the nucleus. The um, SOX10 mostly highlights just the nucleus, so it just helps you see very nicely how many um, cells are there. And it will also stain other things too, like it stains uh, Schwann cells in nerves. So it's not a perfectly specific marker, but it's, it stains both benign and malignant melanocytes, and it will also stain um, most nerves.